I would like to tell a different kind of story and talk about ripples in the cosmic web. We are in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. Let me repeat this wisdom by cultural historian Thomas Berry. We are in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. Now the we is the Western world, especially America. And the stories to which Berry refers are the religious story on the one hand and the scientific story on the other. For thousands of years, most humans derive their sense of meaning and purpose primarily from a religious mythology that goes something like this. We humans were created by divine fiat, some say 6,000 years ago. We were created in the image of God and are therefore superior to the other creatures. We occupy the central point in the cosmos, Earth, in a small cosmos that consists of a few planets and a few thousand stars. And lastly, the Earth is our resource over which we are to have dominion. Now the scientific story burst onto the stage in 1543 with the publication of Copernicus's on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres. The new story exploded the old one. And in the 500 years since Copernicus, we have learned that the universe is anything but cozy. It consists of 100 billion galaxies, each comprised of 100 billion stars. And we don't occupy the center of the cosmos, but we, rather we exist in an ordinary solar system on one arm of a run-of-the-mill run of spiral galaxy. The entire shebang having originated 13.7 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event called the Big Bang. Well, thanks to Darwin, it gets worse. Apparently, we weren't created by divine decree at all but rather by random mutations operating over eons. And we are no different from the other creatures in kind, only in degree. Well, which story are we to believe? It's like having two parents, one of whom tells us how unique and special we are, and the other how ordinary. Do we really have to make the tragic choice, asked Nobel laureate Ilya Prigogine, between an anti-scientific philosophy and an alienating story? Now the tragedy to which Prigogine speaks is prematurely choosing allegiance to one story over the other. That is, in not mustering the courage to live in that tension of opposites that ultimately gives rise to a more satisfying synthesis. Well, in 1999, I taught my first honors class at JMU with the intent, if at all possible, of bridging this divide between the competing stories. Now, the title of the course was unusual, From Black Elk to Black Holes, Shaping a Myth for a New Millennium. That requires some parsing, so let's start with the subtitle. The year 1999 was on the cusp of a new millennium, the third. I borrowed, I borrowed the phrase, shaping a myth, from a book that had meant a great deal to me, Shaping a Personal Myth to Live By, by John Youngblood. John was a mentor to me during the last 10 years of his life. Black Elk, in the title, refers to Nicholas Black Elk, a Lakota or Sioux, holy man whose life and vision are chronicled in the great American classic, Black Elk Speaks, that everyone should read. And finally, Black Holes in the title refers to one of the astounding predictions of Einstein's theory of relativity, that when certain massive stars collapse, they leave a residue so dense that nothing can escape the gravitational tug, not even light. Well, if you're wondering how all of this could possibly fit together, let me at least try to explain. The premise of the course was to look at the universe from two diametrically opposed 
perspectives, from a mythological perspective on the one hand and a scientific perspective on the other. And then to see if we could find resonance or points of nexus between these vastly different perspectives. More precisely, could we possibly create a new story that is faithful both to the revelations of modern science and to ancient spiritual wisdom? Now, my gut told me that we could accomplish this, but I wasn't really certain. And so on the first day of the course, I somewhat sheepishly confessed to the students, I think I have a book in me, and I think that teaching this course will help me to write it. Well, that turned out to be a true statement, and it was also incredibly naive, because it was 13 years before reason and wonder appeared in print. But the confession had a happy consequence. The students realized that this was not the typical course in which the professor was the font of all wisdom. And so they realized that we were making a journey together and that the destination was not predetermined. And I got immediate buy-in. But still, in my wildest dreams, I was not prepared that the course would go as well as it did or touch students so deeply. My favorite course evaluation of all time simply asked, is it appropriate to write on an evaluation that this class changed my life? It did. Well, the course changed my life as well. In short, we were able to establish some of those connections between the competing stories. And as individuals and as a class, we were able to begin to weave together a new myth of meaning that is faithful to the best in both stories, that is faithful to heart and to head. Now, time does not permit us tonight to go into all of these interconnections, but I would like to share one with you so you at least get some inkling of the thrill of the chase. We first read Black Elk Speaks, the book immerses one in the mythology, culture, spirituality, and vision of the Lakota shaman, Nicholas Black Elk. Now, paradoxically, in 1930, Black Elk shared his entire vision for the very first time with a white man, John Nyhart, who was a professor of English at the University of Nebraska. The result of this unlikely collaboration has been called an Indian Rosetta Stone, or a North American Bible of all tribes. Now, from the mythological perspective of Black Elk, we learn that we are surrounded by benevolent thunder beings. From the cardinal directions, the spirits of the East and the South and the West and the North bring us gifts, light from the morning sun from the East, spring warmth from the South, winds and rain from the west, and storms and snow from the north. We rest in the bosom of Mother Earth and we are watched over by Father Sky. And we learn from the Lakota their passphrase, Mita Kuye Oyasin, which translates literally all my relatives, but it implies much more than that. It signifies an interrelatedness, that is a kinship among all creations. It reflects the belief that humans are not masters of creation, but rather participants in a web of life that includes all living beings, the ant people, the buffalo people, the bird people, and the people people. We learn from black elk that trees, grass, and even stones have spirits. And so everything is connected through this great web of life. Imagine then a cosmic spider web that links together all of the components of creation and where the ripples that originate from any one component playing its part jostle throughout the web to influence all other components. We then studied Einstein's theory of relativity, well, at least from a layperson's point of view. Astoundingly, Einstein and Black Elk were contemporaries. From Einstein's 
special theory of relativity, we learned that time is not absolute, that it's, its measurement depends on the frame of reference of the observer. And we also learned that time and space are not distinct as we had thought, but they are woven together into a four-dimensional space-time fabric. From Einstein's general theory, we learned that the geometry of space-time is not Euclidean like a sheet of graph paper, but rather warped by massive objects like stars and black holes. But the warping of space-time is dynamic. It varies in time. And so in the great cosmic dance, matter tells space-time how to warp, and space-time instructs matter how to move. And in this dance, the motions of the stars and the interactions of black holes send ripples throughout the space-time fabric. And at least, this is what Einstein predicted in 1917. Fast forward now to the beginning of the 21st century. In 2002, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO for short, became operational after decades of planning and theoretical work. Now LIGO was designed to detect the gravitational waves that Einstein had predicted, ripples in the space-time fabric. But gravity waves, if they existed at all, would be extraordinarily feeble. Only an instrument of immense size, at least four kilometers in length, and extraordinary sensitivity would stand any chance of detecting these minuscule ripples. With these design constraints came the potential for colossal failure and came enormous expense. Despite these odds, the LIGO scientists convinced the National Science Foundation that the potential of LIGO outweighed its risks, and NSF funded the project to the tune of a half billion dollars. Now, the physicists who proposed LIGO were destined for either of two fates, either a Nobel Prize or the ridicule of history. Operated jointly by Caltech and MIT, LIGO began collecting data in 2002. And for eight years, it detected essentially nothing. The whole venture seemed as if it might be for naught. Well, what should the NSF do? Keep fishing or cut bait? Ultimately, LIGO went offline in 2010 for a five-year, $200 million refurb to increase its sensitivity fourfold. Within days of returning to service in late 2015, LIGO detected two nearly identical gravitational chirps, each of a fifth of a second in duration, one at its facility in Livingston, Louisiana, the other in Hanford, Washington. Now you see two identical facilities are necessary in order to rule out false alarms. Not wanting to cry wolf, the LIGO scientists spent five months verifying the signals. A telltale sign that LIGO had sensed a gravitational real McCoy was a seven millisecond delay in the, in the two signals. You see, Einstein had predicted that light would travel, that, that gravity, gravity waves would propagate at the speed of light. And seven milliseconds is the length of time it takes for light to traverse from Livingston to Hanford. The world-shaking results were published in February of 2016 in Physical Review Letters under the title, Observation of Gravitational Waves from a Binary Black Hole Merger. Four days later, the New York Times reported, the chirp heard across the universe. Now, analysis of the data revealed that scientists were listening to the faint whispers of the merger of two black holes spiraling into one another 1.3 billion years ago. One black hole of 29 solar masses, the other of 36. On October 3rd of last year, 
Reiner Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne received the Nobel Prize in Physics for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. To conclude, Black Elk and Einstein both describe a universe that is geometrically more web-like than Cartesian. Subtle interconnections link every object and every being across time and space. And through that web, ripple effects from events billions of years ago radiate out in all directions to influence us in the here and now. And so, as each of us leaves this room tonight to walk back to our dorms and our homes, we too are sending out little gravitational waves, rippling the space-time fabric to influence future events. <laughs> nonsense, nonsense. The cynics would say nonsense because the ripples created by a human of tiny mass relative to a star or black hole are insignificant. And isn't that truly how most of us feel about ourselves, that we are too small to make a difference? All true, perhaps. But then again, we live in a nonlinear cosmos in which flapping of a butterfly's wings today in Brazil can affect Peoria's weather next week. So small ripples do not necessarily imply small effects. And so my friends, in parting, take yourselves seriously and be mindful how you ripple. Thank you.